Welcome to the Bridge Fellowship Online. We are so glad that you are here, and we hope that this message encourages you today. To find more information about our church or future events, go to tbfonline.net. In Luke 8 this morning. So you can start turning there, but here's what, here's what I need to ask you, and I want to just pick your brain a little bit, because I know uh, every, this is true for everyone in this room. <clears throat> you, you may be the storyteller, but this is true for everyone. There is somebody in your life who is the greatest storyteller you have ever met. That like every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, every, every afternoon, Sunday lunch at grandma's house, when this uncle or mom or dad or cousin or somebody or friend, when they start talking, when they start telling stories, you, you're listening. You guys know who I'm talking about? The person who like, you don't even, like some people are, are good storytellers and you can close your eyes and you can, you can, you can be there. There are some people who are great storytellers and you don't even have to close your eyes. Like you, the world around you starts, just starts changing and you're at the beach, the coconuts are falling and you're just, you're with them, you know what I mean? And you're just locked in. Um, I have a couple people like that in my life. I'm not that storyteller, so I'm sorry for this morning. You're not gonna get a great story, but um, there are people in my life that I'm trying to learn from. Uh, one of those, many of you, most of you should know, and his name is Jim Johnston. And uh I don't know if it's because he's a good storyteller or he just has great stories, um, but if you've ever heard Jim, he's, he's been, he teaches every once in a while, and if you've ever got a hold of him and heard his stories, you, you understand. And if you haven't, you need to ask Jim Johnson about him wrestling a bear in college. Uh, you'll feel like you wrestled a bear in college after he gets done telling you that story. Uh, you need to ask him about his time in Montana, the time that he couldn't get back to his home because the bottom fell out and it started flooding and just the places that he has found himself and the conditions he has found himself in, they're just story worthy. And you just gotta hear him tell the stories because he, he does it justice and nobody else can. So, um, But even as good of a storyteller that Jim is, the greatest story who ever lived, the greatest storyteller who ever lived, his name was Jesus. And and he, he, he pulled crowds in because of the things that he was telling them. And it wasn't just his delivery. Obviously, he's the greatest deliverer ever because he's Jesus. That's pun intended, I guess, but he delivered you and I. Okay. Um, but he also, it wasn't just how he delivered the story, but it was also the story he was telling. It was compelling. And it, it, it was very counterculture. It was not, it was not the, the norm. And so people were attracted to the story and he would draw crowds. Hundreds and thousands of people would come to hear him speak. Um, and there was a moment, and we're gonna see it in Luke 8 as we get there today. He finds himself at the foot of the Sea of Galilee. And if you don't understand what the Sea of Galilee looks like, big miss on my part, I should have had a picture of this, but the Sea of Galilee kind of like ends in a, in a bowl and in the land, the topography, if you would, is this natural amphitheater, okay? Not quite as good as what we have up here on the hill, but it's a close second. Um, that's a joke. It's significantly better. That's, okay, not a, not a stand-up comedy here, but you're tracking, right? It's, it's, it's a perfect amphitheater. The problem is these crowds are starting to push Jesus, quite frankly, into the water. And so instead of telling people to leave, he just gets in a boat and pushes offshore a little bit and takes the opportunity to be able to project his voice up this hill and, and, and to this crowd and begins to teach them. And, and he begins to tell them a story. And, and I can only imagine, and the scripture doesn't say this, but I just, I put myself in that position as he's looking at this crowd of people. And the thing with Jesus' stories is everything he shared was with a purpose. Everything he told them had, had value and reason and purpose. And he would teach them through what he calls, and we're gonna see this morning, is parables, which is where you and I get our word parallel. So he would tell a story, but there would be a, diff, a, a deeper meaning rooted within that, always spiritual. It was always attached to eternity. But he would teach them in a way that they would understand. So he would tell them a story that they would grasp and, and have relevance with, and then he would explain to them what that means spiritually. And so Jesus is sitting in this boat just off of shore, looking back at the land, at the Sea of Galilee, this, this place that was fertile, very rich soil, very good farmland. And he began to tell them a story about a farmer because Jesus knew that everyone on that hillside understood farming. Because in that day and age, they didn't have Whole Foods. They didn't have Publix. They didn't have Kroger. They didn't have you know, whatever that food truck is, it brings, you know, weird looking vegetables and fruits, like the, uh, the unloved fruits or unloved vegetables, whatever that truck's called. You know, like, they didn't have that kind of thing. 
People didn't bring them their groceries. What's it called? Misfit Market. Market. Thank you. So you know what I mean? Like people didn't drop their bags at people's front doors to them. They had to throw seed, turn soil, trust the Lord to water it and harvest it and cook it and, and, and prepare. Like, like they did the work from the moment that they were throwing seed. And so Jesus is telling them the story of a farmer and knowing that every single person on that hillside understood what it, mean, what it meant to farm. I can imagine him looking up and it has this crowd's attention and yet there's some people who don't know who he is and yet there's this massive crowd, but they're, they're going about their day, they're, they're behind the crowd, they're farming the land, doing their thing. And, and he begins to tell a story. He says, let me tell you a story. This is my paraphrase. You can follow along in scripture if you want. But in, in chapter eight, he begins to tell them a story about a farmer throwing seed. And he says, the farmers, they had two ways of, they had two ways of preparing seed. They could take a bag of seed, rip the top of it off, and begin to walk their field. And they would take a handful, and they'd scatter the grain. They'd take a handful, they'd scatter. They'd take a handful, and they'd scatter. Okay? The other option was for the lazy people, which is probably what I would do. Let's be kinder. The innovative people, okay? They would get a donkey or a mule, and they'd punch a hole in the bottom of the bag, and then just let the donkey roam the field. And wherever the donkey went, the seed would fall. Either way, it was very much manual labor. And so everyone understood that we had to throw seed. And back then, it was kind of backwards. Now we would know we had to prepare soil, subsoil it, till it, and then throw seed down. It would take a lot better. Back then, the technology wasn't quite there mentally, so they would throw seed and then work the soil. And so Jesus begins to tell them what they already know. But he says, a farmer would take seed and, and, and throw it and scatter it. And, and he says, some of that seed would land on a path not the sidewalk. We, in your brain, you're thinking path like a sidewalk. You walk down to come to church. But to context, what Jesus is talking about is this footpath in between fields because for them, the community would own this large piece of property and like this parcel would be yours and this would be your family's crop and then the next parcel would be somebody else's and their neighbors and then their neighbors. And, and so you had your own field, but it was all one big field. And so in between those, to get to my field that was right down in the middle of everything, I had to kind of walk between those things. And so year after year, season after season, farmers would have to, they would create these footpaths. And it kind of naturally created this grid. What he's saying, well, I have a picture of it. This is, this is a picture of what it would probably look like, except instead of two, because they didn't have F-150s back then, it would have been probably just a singular Maybe it was like a, you know, one way in, one way out. Maybe, I don't know. But this is definitely from a truck, or some field I found on Google. But just to paint a picture of what it would have looked like, this lush harvest on either side, and then there's this hard footpath in the middle that they, year after year, have beat down the land, and, and they can't, seed's not gonna grow. It just says some of it lands on that path because we're just scattering. And the seed that lands on that path, it has no chance there's, there's, there's no way that that is going to take root or seed because the ground's too hard. And then he says, there's, some of that seed is gonna land amongst the rocks, the rocky soil. And the deal with that is, is, is like I said, they would throw seed first and then they would work the land. And so they would throw seed and scatter it and then they would discover that they have not great soil. And it was full of shell. And if you have lived here very long, if you're, if you're new from whatever state you may be from, if you're here in the last year or two or five years and you haven't took a shovel to the land yet, you may not know about Middle Tennessee. Um, you got about six inches of really good dirt and then it's just rock, okay? And not like shell, like the Mediterranean, like you could, if you really did the work and, and, and fought for it, you could remove it. No, I'm talking like it is, a, it, it is a slab of solid concrete from the Lord, okay? Like you wanna build a fence, for your half acre backyard, $30,000. Why? 5,000 in, 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 in wood, 25,000 in a jackhammer. You know what I'm saying? So that's just how it is here, okay? So we kind of relate. And he says, what's gonna happen to that seed is it's going to take root quickly, but it's also going to die quickly because the shallow, rocky soil cannot sustain that, that, that harvest and that grain. And as, as soon as it came alive and sprouted, it's as quick as it will die. 
He says, and you're gonna continue to throw that, and some of it is gonna land in some soil that's honestly is probably too fertile. It's very rich, over, like very, very, very good soil. So much so that anything will grow in it, and the weeds are gonna take over the crop. It's gonna choke it out. It's gonna kill the crop. And then he defines this last, the best, the right soil, which is this good, rich, high quality, perfect soil. And what Jesus says is, and that crop is going to harvest a hundred, a hundred times. You will reap a hundred times what you sow because it's the right soil. And then he makes a statement. He says, and for those who have ears, listen. He was the greatest story teller that ever lived. But the thing with Jesus' stories is there is always something to the story. So these people are standing here applauding this story, but they're like, you just described my life. <laughs> like, you just described my livelihood. Why are you telling me this story? And even the disciples begin to ask Jesus, what's the point of the story, Jesus? Why are you telling us what they already know? And so this is where we're gonna pick up because maybe you also are confused and quite possibly uh, are very much like them wondering, what is this story about? And Jesus tells us that. So we're gonna switch from Nolan's uh, paraphrase through the first eight verses to the words of Jesus himself. So if you have a copy of God's word, I'm gonna ask you if you're able to stand with me and read from Luke chapter eight, starting in verse nine. He says, his disciples asked him, what is this parable? Well, uh, asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. And I didn't talk about this first service, but I'll quickly explain this. It's, it's just sarcasm that doesn't really quite translate for us in English. You might hear that and think, wow, Jesus is kind of, kind of a turd. He, didn't really, he, didn't, he wants people to be, you know, not hear his truth and not understand his word. No, no, no. What he's saying is, guys, it's not that complicated. Like, you, you just made this way harder than it has to be. Because the very next passage, what's he say? He says, this is the meaning of the parable. So he says, look, don't make this hard that it has to be. Let me explain. And so he does. Verse 11. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, and they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy. And when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe it for a while, but in the times of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear but as they go on their way, they're choked out by life's worries and riches, pleasures, and they do not mature. Verse 15, but the seed on the good soil stands for those who are with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by pers pers persevering, produce a crop. Pray with me. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, you bringing in understanding and clarity to, to your stories and your parables and, and the reason you share them. And God, I pray that your word and your truth would come to life, not just in the lives of the people in this room, but God, that you would bring it to life in my life this morning as I teach. God, you, we love you. I pray all these things in the authority of the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thanks for standing. Have a seat. Uh, so the story of the seed and the sower. Right, what, what does it mean for you and I, wherever we are in life's journey? And that's what I want us to unpack this morning. Uh, and so I don't, I, don't, um, I don't want us to get confused before we ever take off, right? Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, this is very simple, it's very straightforward. He talks about four conditions of soil. And what Jesus says is that's the condition of the heart. And so what I want us to hear this morning, if you're taking notes, is we're gonna look at four conditions of the heart. And he's gonna explain to us that the heart is either hard, it's shallow, distracted, or it's devoted. And the, and the beauty of that and the way that Jesus teaches, he teaches everyone. And so no matter where you are this morning, one of those four conditions define your heart. And what I want us to do this morning is to reflect on that within ourselves and evaluate that. So, okay, where am I today? Where am I right now? And how do I get to the last one? How do, I, how do I get to a devoted, rich, soiled heart? And I don't, um, I don't really ever, I don't name my sermons. Some pastors name their sermons. They're like, I've titled my sermon book. I don't do that. I just teach the word. 
But if I did, I've never, I've never done this, but if I did, I'll tell you, I would title this one, Check Your Heart, Bro. <laughs> I'll just name it because it was easy to name. I don't know. Just Anyway. But here's what you understand. This parable, the point that God is trying to make through his son Jesus is that God is consumed with your spiritual health. Right, more than anything else. Like he wants us to enjoy this life. He wants us to, he wants us to enjoy his word and his truth. He wants you to walk through this life with, with, with simplicity and clarity. Like he longs for that. I know he does, because he's a good father, he's good. He's loving, he's caring, he's full of grace and mercy. But more than anything we can possess and take on and have, he is consumed with nothing more than your spiritual health. Where you will spend eternity is the one thing that he's concerned about the most, and, and that's what he cares about the most passionate. You know how I know that? Not through just assumption, but, but through his word. And, and test me on it, right? Go back and look. We've been in Luke for seven and a half chapters. Like, even, don't even, you don't even have to leave Luke. Just remember where we've been. What does Jesus do over and over and over again? People bring their hurts and their pains and their ailments, dead children, blindness, leprosy, over and over and over again. What does Jesus do first? He heals them spiritually. He forgives them of their sin and then tells them to get up and walk, and then raises the dead, right? And then gives sight back to the blind. What he, what he does first, right, we've talked about it, what we do first are the things we're most concerned with. What does Jesus do first over and over and over again is heal people spiritually, and then proving his design and, and, and heart says, oh, you know what, also, here, have your body back, have your life back, have your sight back, but don't forget what I did for you first. The seed is Jesus himself in this story. It's identified as the very word of God that's going to take root in our hearts and in our lives and it's going to change us. As we move through these soils and work through our life spiritually, the word of God is the seed. And we have to allow it to take root, to mature that and, and, and let it take heart, if you would, and change who we are. The soil, these four conditions of the heart, four conditions of the soil, that's, that's you and me. And like I said, one of these four are going to describe you. And I want you to consider that this morning as we walk through them. So what are the four conditions of the heart? As we jump back into this text and look at it, the first one that Jesus describes and identifies is this path, this compact soil and that's the hardened heart, a hard heart. He says in verse five, a farmer went out to sow seed and he was scattering the seed. Some fell among the path and it was trampled on. The birds ate it up. Nothing takes root on a hard, beaten down path. Not, at, not without working the soil at least, right? You're gonna have to break that up. And if you just leave it the way that it is and water it a little bit, nothing's going to take root there. And the problem is, and the reality is, that's the truth for, for most people's hearts. For the majority of the world, people's hearts are hardened toward the word. How do, we, how, do we, how do we get a hard heart? How do we get so calloused and turned away that we want nothing to do with the word, nothing to do with Christianity, nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with the gospel, and, and, and you can walk to your neighbor's house and invite them to a free event with food trucks, inflatables, free fireworks. You can invite them to the greatest week of their life and tell them that you're gonna pay for it and be totally free. Why do they tell us no? Why do they reject any idea and concept of hope and faithfulness, forgiveness? Sometimes it's because they've been hurt. They've been burned, they've had a bad experience. Somebody has told them that they love Jesus and treated them like they didn't. But a lot of times, they've never given it a chance. And they've, they've consumed themselves so much with 
the pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of accolades, appearance, arrival, and we begin to chase the things that culture tells us to chase. And it's not because we've been hurt by the church, it's because we've never seen the church, because we're so consumed with the world. And over time, our heart, because of the direction and the path that we've been walking, over and over and over again, it grows hard, and it grows calloused. <laughs> and in September, very short while, here's, here's my, I'll prove this to you. Apple is going to have a keynote, and they're going to release the, the iPhone 15. <laughs> and by Christmas, unless you're a weird Android person, every single one of you are going to own that phone. Why? Because we have to keep up. Why? Because culture tells us we have to. No, man, it's just an update. My phone, my screen's cracked. Okay, you believe what you want. We have to stay updated. We have to stay connected. We have to stay with everything new. Does your truck get you from A to B? Yeah. Is your air blow cold? Blow's cool. So I'm gonna go buy a new truck tomorrow. Why? <laughs> Corey sells cars. <laughs> because we have to stay up. And we pursue things so hard. They're not bad. They've just controlled us. And we grow calloused. And the, the reality is, no matter way you, how you turn it, the truth is, the hardened heart, they're indifferent. They're so callous, they're indifferent to the goodness and the gracious and the love of God. And the truth is, there are going to be people who reject the name of Jesus in the gospel because seed fell on a path in a hard heart. I'm not saying you have to stay there, but if we don't break the soil, you will miss Jesus. And so if that describes you this morning and you're, you're only here to prove someone a point, to, to the end of today to say, okay, I tried it, I'm done. Maybe that describes you. And you're like, after that, I'm definitely not coming back. That's fine. Let me place some grace on this. You don't have to stay there. It's just where you are right now. So continue to listen and tune in to what the rest of the soil looks like, and let's progress through this together with some hope. Second soil that he describes, he identifies a rocky soil. What I would say that Jesus also defines as a shallow heart. So we have a hardened heart, we have a shallow heart. This is what he says in verse six. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. So I got a picture of Best picture I could find of rocky soil. It's really not that great, but this is a little, little sprout, a little seedling here. Um, you know what's gonna happen to that? Or probably did happen to that, photo, that like about five minutes after this photo was taken? Turned yellow when it died. Because it's in a rock bed, you know? It's, it's never going to survive. That's not gonna become an oak tree. <laughs> it's going to wither and it's going to die. And no one's gonna harvest whatever comes from that tree is supposed to have come from that tree or anything like that because it's going to die. And what Jesus is saying is, as fast as that springs up, it's going to die. And here's the reality. And here's this, this sea of galleys, people on this hillside, you know what they understand? Some of them are harvesting rocky soil. And it's not this solid rock bed like we have here. It's, it's shell, it, it, it breaks up. But like I said, they didn't, hard, they, didn't, they didn't scatter like we scattered. They didn't understand the technology that you should prepare the soil first and then plant a seed. They threw seed and then broke the soil up. <laughs> so unless they you know, were inherited this property and they understood what they were getting themselves into, they may have come to a surprise. But many of them took their dad's land, who took their grandfather's land, who took his grandfather's land. So they're well aware of what they're inheriting. Some of you have inherited a rocky soul. And what I mean by that is you grew up in a home of addiction. You grew up in a home filled with divorce. 
You grew up without a dad or without a mom. You didn't choose any of those things. Now, granted, some of us went to the quarry and grabbed the rocks and threw them in our life. No matter how the rocks got there, whether you inherited them or you brought them on yourself, some of us are toiling in a rocky soil. And what Jesus says is, you love the idea of hope. You love the concept and the idea of a savior. And so when there's something, a big event happening or this, this freedom is, is, is given to you and, it, and it's, it's right there and they're explained to you, like you'll start the process. But then you're told what it's going to take, which is hard work which is a grind, and you begin to step out because you say, you know what, it's never gonna change. It was handed to me. I'm never gonna be able to fix it. It's too hard, it's too difficult. I don't wanna sweat. I'll just live in my addiction. I'll just live in the pain. I'm out. Because you like the idea of being free, but you don't want to work at it. You know how I understand that? Because I'm a millennial. <laughs> And my generation and every generation following me are riddled with apathy. Like that's what the shallow heart is. That's what the rocky soil is. If I could define it to you in one statement, is an apathetic heart. Oh man, I, want to, I just wanna arrive. I just wanna be given the company. I just wanna be handed the business. Like you, you like the idea of entrepreneurship, but you don't wanna grind it out. You just want dad to hand it to you. You love the idea of Jesus rescuing you from your brokenness and your hurt and your pain and living in eternity in his presence. But you don't have time to read. You don't have time to face your addiction. You don't have time to invest in your marriage. And so you say, you know what, it's not worth it. I'll just get divorced. I'll just have whatever it takes. I'll just, I'll just live in my addiction. I'm not gonna fix that because that's, that's hard. And with, with as much love and grace as I can tell you, you're not wrong, but you, you're right. It's hard. But if you want anything good to develop in your life and Jesus to come into your life and fill you with, with the richness, richness and the love and discipleship and you wanna mature in your faith, you're going to have to get your knees a little dirty and some mud underneath your hands and get down and pull some rocks and brokenness and sin out of your life. Has anybody in here been married for more than 40 years? A couple of you. Hey, can you tell me when you stopped working on your marriage? <laughs> That's exactly right. You want a healthy marriage? I assure you, 40 years into marriage, they haven't stopped working because there's still rocks in their marriage. Like it, it, it doesn't stop. Every day we have to go turn the soil over and be willing together as a husband and as a wife and as a family say, that's not supposed to be in here. What are we gonna do with that? Let's pick it up and get rid of it. And if anybody's in here that's been through Regen, this idea of rocks, <laughs> you understand it. Some of you in this room need to understand that a little, a little closer. And, and there's a free commercial. There's a table outside in the lobby right now because Regen's gonna start in a few weeks. Go talk to Jim about Regen. Just be ready because a lot of you are gonna sign up and the first six weeks are called groundwork. <laughs> That's interesting. And it's gonna identify a lot of rocks in your life and 100 of you are gonna sign up, and 40 of you are gonna finish the program. Because it's too hard. What are the rocks in your life that you think that you've inherited them? I'm really camping out on this one, but we're gonna stay here for a second. You, you really, really wanna be free. You want a healthy marriage, you want a healthy family, you long for Jesus to continue to change you and grow you and mature you as a Christ follower. 
then get down on your hands and knees and ask someone to help you take rocks out of your life because that's what it's going to take. You do not have to stay in a rocky soil, but it's gonna take work. Um, number three, third soil Jesus identifies. He says it's full of weeds and thorns and thistles. It's a distracted heart. It's a distracted heart. We've got a hardened heart, a shallow heart, and a distracted heart. Verse seven says, other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and then it choked out, by, it choked out the plant. Now here's what I want you to make sure we don't do. I do not want you to get confused and think that a shallow heart and a distracted heart are the same thing because they're very different. And here's a very simple defining difference. A shallow heart is the, is the people who have, are, are very apathetic. We like the idea of it, we want it, but we check out because it's too difficult. Like they don't want to do the work. A distracted heart is the hardest worker you know. It is the entrepreneur, it is the business owner, it is the working dad who's at every baseball game but also is working 60 hours a week. It's the working mom whose kids think she's a stay-at-home mom because she grinds out so hard that she's at work but at home and they, and they don't see a difference, right? You are a absolute animal of a parent. You understand hard work. You just work hard at the wrong things. You're distracted. You'll, you'll, you're not afraid to get dirty to pursue something. You're just not pursuing the things that matter. You're distracted. And what we see happen over and over and over again in this distracted heart, it says that it, it, it fell among the thorns. And what I begin to read through this text, you start to see as, as theologians and commentators say, like this ground, it sounds backwards, but the, it's almost too fertile, it's almost too prepared, it's almost too good in a way, because anything will grow there. This isn't my backyard. I was almost too ashamed, so I just found a different picture. But this is this is what some of this is what some of our yards look like. Uh, this is this is what some of our hearts and our souls look like. The ground is so rich that anything will take. Good seed, bad seed, weeds, thorns, and all everything. The land's too fertile. What does that mean for our heart? a distracted heart, a distracted soul, you don't have a problem with saying yes to things. You're really good at that. The problem is you don't know how to say no. And you begin to fill your plate with every single thing. And if I'm not careful, this quickly turns to something that I don't believe that Jesus is saying. And I don't believe it, I don't, I don't believe it either, but some of you are gonna hear me tell you that you're not supposed to do extracurriculars with your kids, that you can't go to all the recitals, that you can't do piano and baseball and all those things. And you're gonna roll your eyes at me and you're gonna stop listening. Don't hear me say that, because that's not what I'm saying, because I don't think that's what the text says. I believe that we serve a God who loves us and has built us for pleasure and activity and joy and, and, and he wants us to enjoy this life. But what we too often do is get so distracted and we, we don't have our priorities in line and we begin to fill our plate with all of those things. They're not bad. I want you to enjoy your life. I want you to pursue your children. I want you to let them do the things they love and you go coach them and watch them and, and cheer them on. My question is, and my concern is, is, is we want this balance between the things of the world and the things for our family and our kids and our job and our careers and, and, and the spiritual. The problem is, in this statement, we want it to balance. <laughs> that sounds really good. We have a balanced life between the things of our family and our, and our life and our spiritual journey. The problem is, that's, that's wrong. That's an incorrect statement. Our life should not be balanced. <laughs> the things of eternity should significantly outweigh the things of the earth. Are they bad? No. Go to the baseball game. Go play piano. Go, go travel the world. I'd love you to tell me your stories when you get home. I love traveling. I think it's, dude, God created it, man. Go see it. But if when the end of your day comes, 
And you look back and say, remember we went to this place and this place and this place and this place and we traveled here and did that and played this game and, and you didn't go to college to play baseball but we spent all that money. Do you remember all those things? Wasn't that great? And you'll have a lot of memories. And then you'll stand before the Father and he'll say, I never knew you because you were distracted. Again, don't hear me tell you, well, no one said we can't, we can't have fun. No. I'm saying the things that are attached to eternity should outweigh those. A couple of weeks, about a year and a half ago, a student came up to me and said that they were gonna stop playing softball. I was like, oh man, just a lot of travel. Mom and dad just asked, gonna step back, cut some things. No. Well, aren't you playing? Because I'm not at church enough. <laughs> student. Honestly, probably had to banter back and forth with mom and dad to convince them that she didn't wanna play. Didn't stop playing altogether, just stopped traveling as much. Because she wanted to take her faith more seriously. Doesn't stop playing, still loves the game, just doesn't do it as much. <laughs> and you know what didn't get taken away from her? A state championship. As a freshman, she's a state championship player. But, she's, but she takes priority here. So don't tell me that if I pursue these things first, all that's gonna be taken away. No, 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 quite the opposite, actually, Jesus says. You pursue me, I'll give you the things of the world. Don't get distracted. And don't make it more complicated than it has to be. The fourth one, he says, is the good soil. It's the devoted heart. Verse eight. It says, still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. If you've been around me very long, um, if you've had any kind of conversation with me, if you I'll introduce you to myself. Hi, I'm Nolan. I don't do good with math. Um, probably dozed off into me. Math classes, our st we were talking with a couple of our staff the other day and I realized something. Oh, I'll get to something. I'll get to the point here in a second. Um, do you know the difference between a million and a billion? Because if you'd have asked me in that moment, it's like one's one, one's two. You know, like one million, one billion, done. Okay, not true. Uh, a million seconds is 12 days. A billion seconds, 32 years. Okay. Would have never understood that concept. I just actually don't understand that concept. Uh, if you get into the whole trillion thing, it's 32,000 years. My point, which is Einstein's point as well, I won't, I won't take credit for it, it's the, it's, it's the multiplication factor. <laughs> Einstein is the one who said that compounding interest is one of the greatest forces the universe will ever understand, and he's right. And it does not just apply with numbers. The reality is that we have to understand that being devoted to the things of God will always be difficult, okay? Don't hear me say what I'm about to say is gonna be something we can celebrate, but before we get to the celebration, I need you to understand, living a devoted heart is going to be difficult, taking a hard soil that does not receive anything and breaking that up, pulling the rocks out of it, continually removing the weeds from our life so that we can live devoted. It's going to take time and effort until we enter eternity. It will not be easy. But it doesn't have to be difficult. We, we, we don't have to overcomplicate this. And so in the same way we start, a hard heart is very easy to describe because it's someone who rejects Christ. We can end the same way. This, 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 this devoted heart, this devoted soul, this, uh, the good, rich soil that he says will receive a yield a hundredfold. It's not difficult to understand. It's difficult to do. It's, it's very simple and we overcomplicate it a lot. You wanna live a devoted life full of, of discipline and discipleship and, and it's, it's life-giving and, and mercy-filled and, and, and just and pouring out the love of Christ to those around you, outweigh the scale, right? Pursue things that are attached to eternity. Like it, it is that simple. If I could say it in a little bit more freeing way, love, love God and do whatever you want. And you're gonna get really confused and hung up on that second part. But you gotta understand the first one. 
if you're fully devoted to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and He is everything to you, pursue whatever you want to pursue. Because if that's true, everything will match and come back to Him. Pursue the things that are attached to eternity. And watch people around you change through you. And there's gonna be a moment when we enter eternity. And if you're a Christ follower, I, I, I think of that moment for me. One of the greatest pieces of that is gonna be when we get to see the people that went before us. People you've longed to see, the people you've missed, the people that you know love Jesus. You're gonna get to see them again. You're gonna see the presence of God. You're gonna, you're gonna be in the presence of the Almighty. What a moment. You know what else is gonna be just as extraordinary? Is to watch people come after you that you had no idea who they were. You've never met them. You've never seen them. And they're gonna say, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, my best friend walked me through the gospel. And you're gonna go to that best friend and say, well, who told you about Jesus? My dad told me. Well, then who, to who told your dad? Man, one of his buddies at work said, you know, like, I love doing this job, but like, life's not about this, it's about church. Invited him to this event, and they went to this event, they showed up at church, they gave his life to Jesus. And, and that guy's pastor, you had a conversation with him, and you're like, dude, when did, what did your walk, like, how did you get to ministry? Well, my student pastor invested in my life, even when I didn't want his investment. Who was your student pastor? Nolan. Do you get what I'm saying? There's gonna be a moment in eternity when you live your life devoted to the word and the things that are attached to eternity. You're gonna get to eternity and you're gonna have this spiritual lineage of people who know Jesus and walked with God because of your faithfulness. <laughs> that is what's worth celebrating. It's not gonna be easy. You're gonna have to get dirty. You're gonna have to pull, you're gonna have to pull burdens out of your life. You're gonna have to work on your marriage. You're gonna have to work on your family. You're gonna have to work on your friendships. You're gonna have to begin to pull weeds. But these, these aren't bad things, but they're just distracting me. What are those things that are distracting you that are out of priority? Are you gonna walk on this hardened path the rest of your life? and reject Jesus altogether? Or are you gonna take the time to either cop out or, or pull some stones out? Are, are you gonna stay distracted? Or are you gonna weed the property and the land so you can have this rich life in Christ? Because here's the reality. It's a choice that we get to make. And the truth is that when you get to this place when you understand that eternity doesn't begin when you die, but eternity begins when you truly start living for Christ, it is in that moment that your life will make a difference. My hope and prayer is that you have heard the truth in the word today, not through me, but through the gospel. I wanna give you an opportunity to respond to it as well. So if you would, bow your head.